So welcome everybody to Discover Australian Pinot Noir with myself, Lydia Harrison, MW. I am a full-time educator at the WSET School in London, where I teach all of our qualifications from our level one course through to our diploma, where I teach Australia. I also teach Bordeaux, fortified wines, uh, tasting technique and various other subject areas. And I also organise our programme of events. So um, over the last year or so, everything has gone virtual and we've been doing various webinars, virtual tastings, uh, and the webinars have all been recorded, as I mentioned. And you can watch those back on the WSET YouTube channel under the WSET School London playlist or via our website. Okay, so without further ado, I'm basically going to uh, get cracking um, talking to you about Australian Pinot Noir. So I have turned to the next slide. I have introduced myself. Obviously, I'm an educator at the WCT. And if you want to uh, contact me personally, you can. There's my Instagram handle there, Lydia Harrison MW. And um, I'm going to start talking about Pinot Noir in Australia. So basically, I went to Australia back in 2017. It was my first and only trip to Australia. Um, I, I really hope to go back once we can travel again. And this was part of my MW Master Wine uh, Stage 2 studies. And we did a fabulous tour. Uh, and I'll point out kind of the, the areas that I visited later. But I visited some of the key regions for Pinot Noir. And that's what I'm going to focus on this evening. So we're just going to start with having a brief look at the history of Pinot Noir in Australia and a little bit about the grape variety and winemaking. And then I'm going to take you through the three regions that I visited and then as well as Tasmania, which I didn't get to visit, unfortunately, but is also uh, a really premium region for Pinot Noir. So we're going to talk through the Yarra Valley, Mornington Peninsula, um, Adelaide Hills and Tasmania. So just starting with a, a very brief sort of history of, of Pinot Noir in Australia, um, it's kind of really the last century the last hundred years that it's really kind of starting to take take off and doing really really well there and kind of they're forging this reputation for premium well-crafted um really expressive pinot noirs um so there were vines planted back in the 1830s um but then there was basically came to a little bit of a standstill there was the gold rush people were focusing on fortified wines and other areas that were kind of warmer and easier to produce and ripen grapes um were favored so it's only more recently in the kind of last 50 years that you start to see this exploration of these kind of cooler areas in Australia, these more premium regions and some of the you know, names and regions that we love today. So um, you started to see it in the 1920s, but you can see then there's quite a bit of a gap until the 1970s where planting really starts to take off. Um, you know, it starts on a commercial scale and clonal selection starts to be considered. Um, and this is something that's really interesting in Australia today is people are really interested in the different clones of Pinot Noir and you will actually see the clones often on bottles on the back label you know producers will tell you what clones they're using which you rarely see you know in, in French wines or in EU wines so there's quite a sort of geeky community of Pinot Noir lovers that will really kind of focus on the different clones and, and which producers are, are using which clones. Uh, so in the 80s, it started to expand and you see that And when we look at some of the key regions like Yarra, Mornington, Peninsula, this is where some of, you know, the kind of founding families and viticultural pioneers started to plant serious quantities and commercial, you know, quantities of these vines in the region. Uh, and so there was an exploration of the kind of better sites uh, and a better understanding of them. And then that continues into the 90s. You had the influx of Dijon clothes from, from Burgundy. So that added to the recipes added to the resources that um, viticulturalists had, the different types of clones, the different qualities that they had and different characteristics. And uh, along with that, obviously, people got more familiar with where they were planting the grape variety, the soils, more experience with the grape variety uh, to where we are today, where everyone is producing, well, not necessarily everyone, but there's a real great a range of quality styles, really interesting wines coming from Australia and these regions. Um, and I've I tasted some recently in a morning to Peninsula tasting and, and the quality and diversity available was, was spectacular. 
So just a, a tiny little bit of information about the, the grape variety itself. Okay, so Pinot Noir, as you may be aware, is a pretty fickle grape. I like to call it the diva of the wine world, if you will. You know, it's a little bit like the Mariah Carey or, or Whitney Houston. Uh, it's pretty fussy, basically, about where it grows. It's quite demanding on soil types. Um, it's thin skin that makes it more susceptible to just to disease and mildew and rot, as does the fact that it's got tight bunches. So that's, you know, worse for air circulation. It means that if there is rot, it will spread quicker. Um, it's early budding and early ripening. So this is beneficial for cool climates. You can ripen this grape, but equally that can sometimes mean it's prone to frost because it will bud early. And as you've seen in probably in the news recently, that can be very devastating. Um, and it's prone to mutation. It's one of the oldest grape varieties, which means it's genetically quite kind of unstable and it mutates very easily. You, you see we have Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, you know, Mernier, all sort of variations of the, the Pinot Noir family uh, and that's why there's lots of different uh, clones of it as well and they will have different characteristics different yields different bigger different sizes the bunches and berries and and so most producers will use some that they've sort of tried and tested but usually also sometimes uh, a mix so that you get different characteristics some might suit better um you know warmer vintages some might suit cooler vintages some are perhaps better on certain soil types so a variety is, is often very useful to have in the vineyard as a blending tool. And then it's suited to cool or moderate climate. So when you think about Australia, it's not going to be planted everywhere. It very much is the more southerly areas of Australia um, and what those that are tempered in climate by coastal influences or altitude. So uh, when we go on to, I'll show you some maps and where we're going to explore, you'll really see the impact of climate. But just a little bit of information about the clone. So um, obviously, as I already mentioned, it's there's <laughs> thousands of different clones. It can get a little bit confusing as well because they have various names in different countries and sometimes they're called different things and they're the same clone or there's a bit of confusion about which clone is which. Um, but as more understanding um, you know, comes into it and people are researching these clones more, um, then people are starting to understand more about their, their differences, their similarities and their and their heritage as well. Um, there's, there's lots of different ones. The key ones in Australia and the ones I'm going to focus on and which came up uh, repeatedly when we visited different producers and are seen as being really good for quality is MV6 and the Dijon clones. And there's various Dijon clones, 114 and 115, which I mentioned there, um, from obviously coming from Burgundy, but there's other ones as well, like 777 and, and different numbers. Um, but MV6 is known for being quite small bunches and berries. So this is low cropping, low yielding, low vigor, but obviously you're going to get good concentration within that bunch. There's more skin to juice ratio, so it can sometimes have more structure. Uh, it's seen as reliable. And some of the producers I visited said they, they used it because it gave that classic kind of earthiness of Pinot Noir and a lovely kind of perfume. Whereas 114, 115, uh, the Dijon clones have larger berries and bunches than MV6. Uh, it can sometimes give a, a light style, not in a negative way, but a little bit more kind of more juicy, red fruit character uh, and aromas. All right. And then obviously with what with Pinot Noir, there's lots of different winemaking techniques you can employ in Australia, like like everywhere else is experimenting and progressing and kind of changing their wine styles as well. And there's lots of experimentation and innovation as you as you tour through. And obviously, uh, viticulturalists and winemakers can you know, uh, impart their own personalities and decisions and winemaking style onto to the variety. So there's no sort of benchmark or or really sort of general style for Pinot Noir in Australia, there's lots of different people doing different things. But just as a kind of thought of some of the options that winemakers have available is obviously uh, cold soaking. This is basically uh, where you will leave the juice of your Pinot Noir grapes in contact with the skins before fermentation, so at cold temperatures, and that helps to extract aroma and flavour from the grapes. Wild yeast fermentation uh, is often employed, especially perhaps in some of the more boutique, smaller wineries. So it's very much a natural fermentation. And while you're waiting for that natural fermentation to start, the cold soaking will naturally be occurring so they can interact. 
Um, you've got things like whole berry fermentation, stem inclusion, and whole bunch fermentation. So varying degrees of having some of the stems or portion of the stems in the fermentation, which can add sort of freshness and sort of stemmy kind of green characters to the wine. Um, Equally, if you have whole berries uh, or whole bunches, the grapes can also do a proportion of uh, carbonic maceration as well, which can kind of accentuate fruit character and colour. So these are all techniques that you may choose to employ or partially employ. Uh, and then extended maceration. So often post-fermentation as well, you might want to leave the grape. The, the wine on the skins for a little bit longer. This is to extract further tannin uh, and further colour. And as Pinot Noir is the thin skin grape that doesn't extract, um, doesn't naturally give up too much colour and doesn't have too much tannin, this can help if you want a slightly darker colour, slightly more structured style. A lot of wineries here are doing what we call minimal intervention. So really kind of reining back what they do in the winery, focusing on the quality of the grapes in the vineyard. Are they ripe? Have they got lots of aroma? Have they got the structure? And then kind of really easing off with the winemaking technique. So just sort of letting things happen naturally. Often there's kind of gravity flow vineyards using you know natural yeast um, and, and just sort of not interfering. A lot of the wines are unfined, unfiltered, that sort of thing. Um, there's a trend generally for kind of using less new oak, perhaps less toasted oak, less new oak uh, and moving to larger format oak barrels as well. So I thought this picture here was quite fun. This is actually from a visit to Penfolds that I did, but it shows you some of the weird and wonderful names for the different size barrels. Um, we normally talk about Barriques being 225 litres, but you've got Hogshead there, which is 300 litres. You've got Punchins, which are bigger again at 475 litres. And there's a lot of producers that are kind of moving to larger barrels, perhaps a higher proportion of older oak to lessen the impact of the wood and really let the kind of fruit primary characteristic shine through. There's also use of concrete. A lot of people feel it gives a little bit more mid palate to the wines. The, the movement um, of the fermentation, um, if you ferment in concrete, that, that movement of the wine can give a little bit more kind of texture and mid palate, it's felt rather than say stainless steel. Um, and equally you can age in concrete or amphora, you know, as these trends you see around the world, you see them globally. And obviously um, Australia also incorporates some of these innovative um, wine making techniques into their practices. All right, let's focus on Australia then. So this, as you can see, is a map of Australia, huge country. And um, obviously Pinot Noir therefore is focused on these more southerly areas here. So you can see down in Melbourne in the state of Victoria, this is where we have Yarra and Mornington Peninsula, which I'm going to talk about. And I flew into Melbourne on my trip. So I landed in Melbourne at a rather late time and we went straight to, to Mornington Peninsula the next day uh, so it was a, a pretty intense trip but you can see we're, we're pretty southerly here and then if we go over to Adelaide and Adelaide Hills which is nearby Adelaide up in South Australia but still very much coastal and then the other region I'm going to focus on is Tasmania which is the, the most southerly GI of Australia so we're really focusing on these cooler latitudes you know further away from the equator for Pinot Noir and we actually did a drive from Melbourne sort of through the vineyard regions and all the way up to Adelaide through Coonawara um, and up to Adelaide Hills, Barossa, etc. So it was a it was a fabulous tour of, of some of these parts of Australia and some of the, the wine regions. So just zooming in a little bit more detail here, you can see we sort of zoomed into that southern part of Australia. This is the state of Victoria and this is where I'm going to be talking about Yarra Valley here. So just outside Melbourne and then equally Mornington Peninsula here as well, not far from Melbourne. And then I'm going to go up here, which was the other end of our road trip because I attended the seminar in Adelaide and we visited the Adelaide Hills, which again, very close to the city, um, but up in the hills. And Tasmania obviously is off the map down to, to the south here. All right, I'm going to start in Yarra Valley because this was actually our very first visit straight after I landed in Melbourne. And this is a picture of Hoddle's Creek Vineyard, which is one of Mac Forbes uh, vineyards in, in the Yarra Valley. And you can kind of get an idea for the picturesque scenes there. It's, it was beautiful and sunny. We had great weather. I visited in November time. So we were kind of, it was kind of spring in Australia. And um, you can see there the vines are just starting to grow. 
And this I thought was quite a cool map that I took actually at Mac Forbes, a picture of it was on the wall there. And it just kind of shows you a little bit of the topography here. So you can see where Melbourne is on the coast. It's pretty flat. Here's Mornington Peninsula and Yarra is basically up from that. And obviously, therefore, you can see it's starting to go into the foothills of the Great Dividing Range here. And that provides some altitude. So this is why you have um, different altitudes. If you see in here my text ASL, that means above sea level. That's my shorthand. So if that from everything from sort of 30 meters up to 400 meters as you go north, what's called the upper Yarra. And then obviously you've got the lower Yarra, which is where it's flatter and, and further south towards the coast. So there is a real range of altitudes here. And because Pinot Noir is a cool climate, grey, but moderate climate and doesn't like it too hot, you are starting to see people in the Yarra Valley planting higher up up, higher up in the Yarra, planting new vineyards further up than they ever did before. Uh, and you're actually seeing some producers sort of changing uh, to different grape varieties. There is a lot of Cabernet grown, for example, in Yarra, in the lower Yarra. That's how warm it is. So Pinot Noir is very much more suited to some of these vineyards that have higher altitude, that brings down the temperature. It gives a nice diurnal range as well. And that's just better for your Pinot Noir grape. It's called Mediterranean here, so generally quite dry summers. You do need to irrigate, um, but you have got some coastal influences, some sea breezes, and that can help you know prevent it from getting too hot, which is great. Um, really range of, of soils, as you can kind of see by this mountain range here. You know, you've got really ancient soils across Australia, and there's going to be different uh, you know types depending on on the rock and where you are on the mountain. Um, but you have a mix of sort of grey brown soils, and then also some clay subsoils in certain areas, and then sort of volcanic soils on the southern side of the valley as well. And just to give you a range, when I visited in 2017, they were sort of giving us a summary of the last few vintages. And just to showcase here that, you know, vintage variation is still key in Australia. It's not always the same every year. And you have some years which are very dry and can give very small yields, like 2013 in the era. 2014, they had a lot of frost. And obviously that was very problematic for our early budding Pinot Noir. 2015 was seen as a great vintage. So if you see any 2015 Yarra Valleys, snap them up. They're really good. Uh, 2016 was a warm year. Some of them had, you know, some of the vineyards had ho hottest ever temperatures. So they're usually quite fleshy, quite round, kind of fuller bodied styles as well as a, as a general rule. All right, I'm going to focus on, obviously, the producers I visited. Um, I'm not going to pretend I know everything about the Yarra Valley or all the producers. I'm just going to give you my insight, my experience, who I spoke to, what some of the trends I came across. Um, and one of them that I visited in the Yarra was Mac Forbes. And this is a really kind of small boutique kind of artisan winery. Um, they don't necessarily own all their own vineyards. A lot of people in Australia will buy grapes from long term contractors. But they did obviously want to have a lot of influence on what happened in the vineyard because for them, you know, quality was crucial. So they really they did own some of their own vineyards and their single vineyard range will always be sort of fruit from their own sites or sites that they are very much involved with. Uh, I spoke to Austin Black, who was the winemaker at the time. I believe he's moved on now. Um, but yeah, he was talking again, as I mentioned, about some producers were switching, pulling up Pinot Noir and planting Cabernet Sauvignon, especially in the lower Yarra. Because temperatures are rising, it is getting warmer here. Uh, but they are based in the upper Yarra, so they have you know altitude on their side. Um, it's interesting as well because um, some parts of Australia are phylloxera free, but unfortunately the Yarra Valley is not and parts of it have been affected by phylloxera. They lost a four acre vineyard to phylloxera uh, and so, you know, Mac Forbes and other vineyards are having to start to replant on rootstock to, to get past this issue. They will also select rootstock for drought resistance because, as you can see, all my photos look very sunny, very lovely and dry. So they do need to irrigate. And so by at least ensuring you've got, you know, drought resistant rootstock and thinking about um, the soil where you plant your vines will help, you know, sort of ensure that you can cope if you do have a drier vintage. And they're actually looking at reverting to dry farming. So uh, they will water the vines when they first plant them, but then kind of let them establish without um, supplementing the water so that hopefully they can thrive even in the dry conditions. They were also doing some experimentation with cordon heights. So this is 
sort of how high or low you train your vine. And they sort of felt that lower down was better. It meant the nutrients had less far to travel from the soil and were supposed to be better for quality. But equally, some of the higher cordons and higher drain vines allowed more shading of the fruit, which is important in this quite dry, sunny area. And then obviously you've got the practicalities of what level the grapes are to enable you to pick. And if you're hand picking, you don't want to sort of necessarily be stooping down really low and doing backbreaking work. So they were experimenting with different cordon heights and they had a range of vineyards. So just to kind of show here some of the difference of altitudes that you get here in the Yarra, um, Cold Stream Vineyard was much warmer. This was only 80 metres above sea level and therefore would kind of give a riper style of Pinot. The Yarra Junction wine that they make was from one of their coldest vineyards right up at, in the upper Yarra at 220 metres above sea level. Uh, and then the Wurri Yalok Vineyard, which is actually where my picture is taken, which is where I was standing. After having been disinfected, I had to stand in bleach uh, in, in, in wellies and things so that we weren't possibly transferring fluxa around. Um, it was, it was kind of in between. Um, so they obviously have different sites and they'll pick different fruit at different times and they'll work all the kind of vineyards individually uh, and have, you know, perhaps, you know, three, four weeks of different picking times to make sure that each vineyard is kind of at the best level. Um, they also, just in terms of overall style for Mac Forbes, is they very much kind of like a leaner style. So they pick the fruit early. They want to retain the acid. They want a kind of leaner savory style they really want the acid to kind of be the main talking point rather than lots of ripe you know fruit so they're kind of this leaner style um and they don't really do cold soaking for color so sometimes their 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 reds are very pale that's their stylistic stylistic choice they're not really too bothered about the color they just will um just go sort of straight into the fermentation uh, and in some years in the warmer years they will use a little proportion of whole bunch as well so to give some of that stemmy character to give some aromatics as well and all their reds are unfined unfiltered it's very much hands-off in the winery they will be very hygienic and therefore they say you know if you've done everything right you don't need to find or filter your wines so that was just a little bit of an insight uh, into mac forbes for you there Right, let me move on. It's all taking me back. I wish all these pictures preparing this PowerPoint are really making me wish you could travel and I could go back to Australia. <laughs> and this is my own photo. This is Mornington Peninsula. So this was our next stop on my travels. And gosh, doesn't it make you want to visit? <laughs> Uh, this is kind of from a viewpoint, it's called Arthur's Seat, down sort of more in the south of the peninsula, which is where it's higher. So that as you go south, as you sort of get further away from mainland, you've actually got more altitude here. And you can see it sort of looking back, you've got beautiful beaches. Um, this is primetime real estate here in Mornington Peninsula. So uh, as you can see, it's sort of 70 kilometres southeast of Melbourne, so really is on the doorstep. So they've obviously got a great market for their wines locally there's a lot of tourism and people come for weekends and holiday homes here but the negative side of that in terms of viticulture is it puts a huge pressure on land prices so it's very expensive to buy vineyards here if you haven't you know aren't, weren't fortunate fortunate enough to have got vineyards back in the 90s then it's 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 pretty expensive now and obviously you're fighting with developers and people that want holiday homes and all other sort of tourism um, and other activities uh, but it's a beautiful place to have on the doorstep you can get there very easily from from Melbourne and you've got everything you need there's great restaurants wineries beaches you know it was it was a brilliant uh, couple of days here so the it is a peninsula obviously okay so you're surrounded by water on all three sides you've got the Bass Strait the Port Phillip Bay I've got a map to show you in a second and the Western Port Bay so no vineyard site here is more than seven kilometers from the ocean just to give you a little bit of a perspective so the very much a you know maritime influence here it does rain it's wetter in the southerly part of the peninsula as you kind of get further out into the sea as you might expect um and everywhere here is going to have some winds okay whether it, again it can be windier in the south but 
where the, you know, you've got winds coming from different directions. Um, and there's a real range basically here of different topography. So it can depend which way you're facing, whether it's east, west, south, you know, north. You've got different valleys, different ridges uh, and whereabouts you are on the peninsula. Um, they don't typically get frost because of this. Obviously, the body of water here kind of keeps the temperatures a little bit warmer. So it's really good for hopefully protecting your early budding Pinot Noir. And then you've always got a sort of mild summer and autumn, usually um, nice kind of temperate temperatures because of the influence of the water. So it doesn't get too hot. So again, perfect for, for Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, these grapes that, that thrive here. But you can obviously have winds, and if this comes at springtime, this can be particularly unsettling for the vines. This is flowering and fruit set, which can be an issue, and obviously a bit of rain and disease pressure um, can, can sometimes be a problem. Pinot Noir really is the kind of key grape here. It's almost half the annual crush, so really is thriving in this area. And again, you, even within the peninsula, you can get varying styles from different producers, depending on where they are. And the locals call it up the hill and down the hill. So I was a bit confused when I attended a Mornington Peninsula webinar recently. What do they mean up the hill, down the hill? But down the hill is actually the northern part of the peninsula. OK, so. If you think you're going down towards the mainland where it's flatter, OK, and you've got deep, fertile kind of sandy soils up here. And then up the hill is in the south of the peninsula. As you go south, you get more altitude. OK, so they call it up the hill. There's more. Uh, this is where kind of the picture is taken of me looking very cheesy and very pleased with myself being in Mornington Peninsula. But there's different soils. You can have some clay. There's some volcanic based soils here as well. And one of the other things that they're doing here is kind of a trend uh, to higher density planting as well. And then I've just talked a little bit there about um, you have some of the sort of first producers there. Um, Main Ridge Estate, which I also visited, was one of the first people to kind of plant Pinot Noir commercially in Mornington Peninsula. And there's around 200 small scale vineyards. So it's very much kind of boutique, small family owned producers. And they have um, an association which is called Mornington Peninsula Wine. But is uh, that's the training name of Mornington Peninsula Vineyards Association. Um, so they're a very collaborative body as well to promote the wines of the region. So this gives you a nice little map here, just shows you a little bit kind of more about the peninsula. So you can really see you've got Port Phillip Bay here, the Bass Strait, and then Western Port Bay, uh, which is kind of on the east rather confusingly. But you get an idea. So you really are surrounded by water. Um, you highlighted here some of the estates that I tasted recently at the tasting and I went to 10 minutes by tractor which is here um, but you can get an idea of where the different estates are and this is Arthur's seat this is where my photo was taken earlier from this viewpoint and I've got another map here which um, really shows you this was from 10 minutes by tractor which shows you the topography so you can see it's much flatter here in the north what they call down the hill whereas when you go further south down the peninsula you can see this altitude here this is where you're going to get some of your higher altitude vineyard sites but it can be a little bit wetter um, you're not so protected um, and this can actually the, the vineyards here and the altitude can actually protect some of the vineyards in the more northerly parts of the peninsula so they can often perhaps have less wind and rain than those that are more southerly and this also shows the three vineyards so it's called uh, 10 minutes by tractor it was originally three vineyards the mccutcheon vineyard here judd vineyard and wallace vineyard because they were all you know 10 minutes from each other by tractor so you can see their different locations um circled in this southern part here and this is where I'm going to talk about. So this was 10 minutes by tractor that I visited. And um, well, it was a it was a brilliant, uh, really, really premium producer, very focused on quality with loads of um, you know, meticulous work going on in the vineyard. Um, a real sort of not trying to copy Burgundy as such, but a real belief in, you know, the that they wanted to achieve the kind of quality level and the precision that they have in Burgundy. And so loads of really, uh, you know, a lot of efforts in the vineyards, plot by plot, um, experimentation and working through, through the vines and meticulous winemaking as well. So just a little history. So in 2004, um, Martin Spinning purchased um, 
he used to be in finance and he purchased the 10 minutes by tractor estate. So fortunately for him, it had already been planted in the 90s. So you had some age, you already had vines that were over 20 years old, uh, which is great for buying quality. And I spoke to Sandro, who is the winemaker there. And they are based up on Main Ridge. So there's Main Ridge Winery, but there's also the area Main Ridge. It's a ridge. Uh, and and um, there it's sort of higher. It's cooler. It's in that southern part of Mornington Peninsula. There's three vineyards, um, only 10 minutes apart. So we've got Wallace Refinement. Um, they say it's refinement and vibrant in the city. So they basically do single vineyard bottlings. And um, this is a warmer site with red volcanic soil and it's north facing. So you're getting most of that kind of more sunshine, more ripeness in the in the wines and that's uh, solely planted with the mv6 clone which can be a little bit more powerful a little more structured mccutcheon uh vineyards they say has elegance and power this is east facing so it kind of gets the nice gentle morning sun and it's also at a higher altitude so they pick this one and a half weeks later than the Wallace Vineyard. So just showing that diversity within a really small space uh, on the map. And then Judd's, uh, they say, has alluring aromatics and a fine structure. And this is, again, one of your Dijon clones in 115. And when I was there, they just planted a new vineyard. So this is just kind of to show that they are focusing perhaps now on, on higher density plantings here. So they planted a new vineyard at 12,100 vines a hectare. Their others, their traditional ones are 3,000. Like a lot of um, previous, you know, Australian vineyards have bigger spacing to allow for, for tractors and, and logistics. But now they're sort of starting to focus on maybe having more vines that naturally restricts the yield of the vine. You can see there they get 400 grams of fruit per vine rather than two, three kilos as, as the standard. But they feel that that gives better quality. In terms of their winemaking style, 10 minutes by tractor tend to do 100% de-stem, so they don't do any stem inclusion. They macerate for four to six days, and this happens naturally while they're waiting for the wild yeast fermentation to kick in. Uh, they use concrete fermentation vessels, and again, this is what I was talking about earlier, they feel it gives a little bit more mid-palate depth, the, uh, the movement of the wine during the fermentation helps to give a little bit more texture uh, and they use a, a mix of new and old French barriques and they will you know vary the amount of new oak depending on the vintage depending on the label of the wine and they've also over time reduced the toast level so again letting really the the sort of fruit character shine through and the oak being more a complementary secondary characteristic all right, that's it about 10 minutes by tractor. I can see there's a ton of questions. I've got 76. I'm not going to be able to answer all those later. So perhaps just popping any questions that are really, really crucial. Otherwise, I will not be able to, to answer them all. Uh, right, I'm going to move on. This is Adelaide Hills. So we have changed state now. We've gone up. Uh, we did a long drive, as I said, through Kunawara, Um I actually went through the Grampians as well and then up to Adelaide where we visited Adelaide Hills uh, and it is hilly. This picture does show that. Uh, I was driving the car that day and there are some really sort of windy roads you, you do have to go up and so altitude here is crucial because you are at a slightly warmer latitude but you're very much therefore got the elevation and the coastal influence still in the Adelaide Hills. So just to give you an idea here, uh, we are in the state of South Australia. There's quite a bit of German heritage. Um, Adelaide Hills is not that far from Eden Valley, Clare Valley, which are famous for Riesling. So a lot of German immigrants that bought, obviously, that Riesling great variety with them. And you can see here, definitely, of the places we looked at so far, it goes up to the highest altitude. So up to about 650 metres above sea level. I think there's even some vineyards now that are perhaps even above that as they explore new areas. But yeah, a definitely altitude here, really, really important. That's going to give diurnal range. So it allows good ripening during the day, nice warm temperatures, but that drop at night that really helps to preserve the acidity in the grapes here. So really suitable for, for Pinot Noir. It's moderate climate. Okay, so, it, you know, it is um, more northerly, so it's, it's not as cool as, say, Tasmania, but it is maritime here. So it will rain during the growing season. Uh, and therefore, that can give issues with disease. There is humidity and that can put pressure on the grapes. And, um, you know, sometimes they just have rot or acetic rot and that can be very detrimental. 
Um, again, mix of soils, different things going on, different vineyards. Uh, and Pinot Noir here is one fifth of the annual crush. So not quite as big as some of the other areas. There are other grapes grown here like Syrah, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. Um, but Pinot Noir is still an important part of that lineup. And again, more recently, kind of following that, that history, it's been 1990s where you've really seen a boom in plantings uh, and the younger generation now really focused on kind of viticulture in the region and, you know, um, experimenting and really refining uh, the wine production here. Again, it's very accessible from Adelaide. So you do have pressure of, you know, land being wanting to use for houses or tourism and other things, but um, there's some really top quality vineyards here too. And one of those that I visited was Murdoch Hill. So a really sort of small scale producer. Um, Michael Downer was the, the winemaker I spoke to who had been voted Young Gun uh, Winemaker of the Year um, fairly recently to when I visited in 2017, which is a, it's a very, very uh, prestigious accolade. And he, he really explained, you know, it gets half a uh, Celsius degrees cooler every 100 metres you go up here. So that is the importance here of altitude. Um, you also had, as I talked about, that great diurnal shift that, you know, just helps um, keep freshness in the grapes and, and gives you the aromatics. One of the, the subregions here is called Piccadilly Valley, and this is a much cooler GI site. Some of them are higher altitude sites, and they sourced a lot of fruit from there for this freshness and aromatics. They also had another vineyard called Ashton Vineyard, which was um, the 114 clone, one of your burgundy clones, which is very low yielding. They sort of gave thought it gave a delicate floral and savory character. So they did blend fruit from different vineyard sites from different clones to really kind of give a kind of range of different wine styles um, to, to, their, to their production. Uh, they also had some 115, they did some whole bunch with that. Um, and so they thought that contributed to some delicate red fruit, foresty kind of characters and red currant floral notes as well. So you can see the benefit here of blending the different uh, clones that you use again a little bit like Mac Forbes they pick early so the alcohol alcohol levels here were very moderate kind of 12 and a half 13 percent they were very focused on gentle extraction so they didn't want too much tannin and they maybe do a little bit more in cool years to get flavor from the skins but they didn't want to produce a sort of really heavy uh pinot noir no fining or filtering again so that minimal intervention and and small production 5,000 6,000 cases that's it um, they did Pinot Noir, but as I also said, um, they also did Chardonnay and Syrah. And for them, the Pinot Noir is a bit of a hard sell, you know, that for, for the amount of effort that went on in the vineyard and the quality of the grapes and the effort in the, the winery, um, they found it harder to sell Pinot Noir at the kind of price point that the effort that required. Um, but nevertheless, they were they were continuing and they did a really interesting range. So you can see some of the lineup of the wines I tasted here. And you had a wine called Ridley, which I brought home a bottle with me because I thought it was fascinating. This was a blend of three Pinots. So it was Pinot Noir, but also 10% Pinot Gris and 30% Pinot Meunier in the mix. So 60% Pinot Noir, which they thought really gave it, you know, that lovely red fruit and roundness. Um and some of that kind of classic earthy, you know, foresty character. Pinot Gris, which they thought gave it some texture and almost kind of Turkish delight character. And then 30% Pinot Meunier, which kind of gave it rhubarb and kind of juicy fruit. And it was a really interesting blend. And they they just make it to be a kind of really easy kind of summer red, a um, little bit of time in old oak, but then it's released early, ready to drink. So a really good summer red. Then you had the Phaeton Pinot Noir. So this was kind of one of their sort of more premium bottling, bottlings from their different vineyards. And here they would do some whole bunch. So 40% whole bunch for the one I tasted, 15% new oak. So not too much new oak, but just a little bit to give some extra flavor there. And then they also did a wine called the Sulky, which was a blend of Syrah and Pinot Noir. So almost kind of harking back to uh, historically when people used to say they used to blend a bit of Rome wine into Burgundy or perhaps thinking more about like kind of Cote Roti where it's Syrah with um, Viognier, this is Syrah with Pinot Noir and they think that Pinot Noir 15% just adds, adds this lovely kind of ferny, foresty kind of lift and aromatics to, to the Syrah. So just showing there, I think some of the innovations, some of the different kind of wine styles that you you can get in in um, in Adelaide Hills. 
All right. And then finally, I'm going to talk about Tasmania, which unfortunately I did not get to visit. As I said, um, we didn't have time. I, I went to Australia for two weeks, but a week of that was my MW course. So we didn't make it across Tasmania, but I would have loved to visit. And I think this picture really shows just how incredible it is. Um, but I can still tell you a little bit about it. I definitely made a point of tasting some Tasmanian wines while I was there, obviously, because they were much more easily available than in the UK. Um, and this is a great map from Wine Australia, just showing the different areas within Tasmania. So you can see here um, a lot of the viticulture is more on the north or south or east coast. So this is where it's not going to be quite as windy or wet as the west coast. So that's why viticulture tends to kind of move over to the, the eastern side of the area. And you can see the different valleys here. So Tamar Valley, which you might have heard of, Derwent Valley down here in the south, Corinth Valley. So again, different terroirs, different soil types, different aspects and exposures. Um, but obviously, very much kind of by the coast the vineyards here so you're, you're going to have definitely a maritime influence it's very cool we're the furthest south this is the most southerly GI in Australia so it's perfect for Pinot Noir and um, that is one of the the most planted grapes 43 percent of the grapes here is Pinot Noir uh, they also plant Chardonnay that's the next biggest and therefore also you can make sparkling wine. So more than 40% of the wines produced in Tasmania are sparkling. So you've got Pinot Noir being used for both sparkling here and for your, your red wines. Uh, and it's just so suitable for this because of the climate, this cool climate. This is one of the kind of true cool climate regions of Australia. Uh, other places will say cool. Sometimes they're sort of meant more cool to moderate or moderate with cooling influences. Whereas Tasmania is definitely cool. You're far south, you're surrounded by the ocean, most southerly GI, uh, very maritime influence. So it is wet. So you do have these issues of disease here, wind, rain, frost can be a problem because it's cooler. Um, equally, you can then have droughts, which seems ironic. But yeah, the vintages can really, you know, can really vary. Uh, and you can also have pests. So it's quite a labor of love here to, you know, keep Keep your grapes uh, healthy and intact. They have windbreaks to try and obviously temper and, and shelter the vineyards a little bit, particularly important at, at flowering. Drip irrigation if necessary to supplement the rainfall if it doesn't happen at the right times. Netting to protect from birds um, and then leaf removal as well. So this can be beneficial to not have too much shading or kind of a damp, moist canopy that can spread disease. So there's some of the techniques they'll employ here. You've got a little bit of altitude here still, but obviously some of it, um, especially down the coast, is near the coast going to be sort of flatter. The majority of vineyards are below 100 metres above sea level. And there I've just highlighted a couple of the different values that we saw there on the map of kind of different soil types from sandstone and schist to gravelly basalt, clay, limestone, etc. Um, and again, very much kind of small scale vignerons. So there's about 230 individual vineyards. And um, there's still a lot of other things in, in Tasmania, sort of sheep farming and, and other crops um, but vineyards now really being taken seriously because you've got a brilliant climate for it um, for really quality wines for sparkling wines for really premium still wines um, so there's seven different um, growing areas uh, and as I said you know in those easterly southern or northerly parts and and there's a real kind of food and wine scene here as well so very much kind of tourism gourmet you know food and um, wine destination so I will definitely hopefully visit next time I get to go back to Australia okay and then before I have a an attempt at trying to answer some of the many questions that come through. I just wanted to highlight some of the producers that I thought were worth a taste. So this is not endorsed by WCT. This is just some that I either visited or have fortunately been able to taste fairly recently in the case of Mornington Peninsula, um, but other tastings that I've been to and I just think give a really nice range of styles. I've had a look and tried to put where you can some UK um, stockists but equally, you know, have a Google of them and, and, and seek them out if you, you're located somewhere else. 
And this is a picture of the Liz Dillon, which I tasted from Tasmania while I was in uh, Willunga, which is outside Adelaide at this beach uh, at a restaurant. And it was just, look at that. I mean, it just makes me want to go, to go back. <laughs> so there's lots of different ones. A coat of barrels, sadly, the, the winemaker that we met when I was in Adelaide Hills passed away recently, it made brilliant wines, very kind of minimalist intervention really interesting you've got the producers I've talked about as well Muridak Estate which is run by a fellow MW and a friend of mine Kate McIntyre some really interesting wines there so there's just some recommendations for you there from everything from quite bigger producers like De Bortoli and Yara to really sort of niche producers uh, as well and some extra resources. So um, wineaustralia.com has a whole host of information, some of which um, I've used their pictures and, and, and some of their information. So really worth checking out. You've got the Australian Wine Research Institute. That is a wealth of knowledge. And I visited them um, and very scientific research that they undertake. And then also that Mornington Peninsula Wine uh, Association that I was talking about there as well. Brilliant. Okay, so that was a little whirlwind trip through Australia. I'm going to try and have a look at some of these questions, but please apologies if I don't get to answer all of them. So, oh, what are the principal changes for aging Pinot Noir? Different sizes of oak. So yes, there was quite a few questions about oak uh, and the the different sizes. Um, so obviously the larger barrels will just have less impact. You've got less uh, contact with the wood. You've got more wine to wood ratios. So it just gives a more subtle influence. Still allows oxygen in, but just your, the, the flavours of the oak will not be as dominant, basically. So and, and with Pinot Noir, they're just tending to sort of ease off on the oak and just letting the kind of perfumes and the, the primary characters shine through. So hopefully that's answered that one. I refer to GI, yes. So um, they just call it in the new world, it's a geographical indication. So Yarra Valley is a GI, that's what you'd see on the label. Same thing as an appellation in France. Okay. Uh, right. Um, Patrick McGuigan, are Mac Forbes making wines to be aged? Absolutely, yes. So um, a lot of the wines here will, will age really well, um, particularly Pinot. We know it can age. Uh, Mac Forbes also do some great Riesling, which is really age worthy. It's got really high acidity which and loads of flavour concentration. So they can definitely answer those wines. Answer those wines. <laughs> Definitely age those wines. Uh, 